Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming down stream A to my river. I'm very happy to have you because I know you had a choice of stream B. So thank you for choosing us and my wonderful three speakers that you're going to hear today on the lightning talk. So I really hope you enjoyed Rick, Rona, John and Indy's presentation this morning. Um, it was so perfect really to get the foundation for this whole conference and now it's time to have some fun in this room because in the spirit of the euros you have to get a little competitive if you can beat the five minute bell or not so i'm gonna have josie tim and sophie take on the challenge so they have to give a lightning talk that's under five minutes um and lightning talks have been part of find a cure since 2015. um it's really our chance to open the stage up to whoever has the guts really to try to tackle a five minute challenge to share their personal stories, um, experiences, their drug repurposing project or cause in this instance. Um, up first is Josie. So Josie um, is gonna introduce a new initiative that she started with Lindsay who couldn't be with us today. So we don't have the dynamic duo, but Josie can definitely hold her own. So that's okay. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Josie who can share her screen and do her lightning talk. Hi everyone. Um, it's always great to speak at a Find Secure event. So thank you for, for inviting me. Um, unfortunately, Lindsay, um, some of you may have known her as Lindsay Weaver, former Chief Executive of Metabolic Support UK can't join us today. So, so it's just me. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I've been working primarily in rare diseases for the last 10, 12 years now. I have worked in as a payer, so I've been a commissioner. I've set up the highly specialized technology program at NICE. I've sat on the board of patient organizations and I've worked in industry. So I have worn many, many hats and, and all of them have really led me and indeed Lindsay to, to realize advocacy. I'm gonna to attempt to change my slides. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'm gonna to talk to you about today um, is patient involvement in health technology assessment, in, in reimbursement in access processes. Um, over the last 10, 12 years, I've certainly heard a lot of people talk about repurposing Find a Cure, fantastic events, a lot of focus on helping patient groups, helping companies come together and develop new treatments, new indications for, for existing products, which is fantastic. Um, what can often be missing, though, what I've found can be overlooked and sometimes undervalued has been the importance of preparing, engaging for health technology assessment and the importance of the role of patients, both individual patients and patient organisations in those processes. Um, just to, to reflect on that, so regulators, we're talking MHRA, the EMA, European Medicines Agency, that's where a lot of the attention goes. That's where the science is driving to, to getting a licence, getting an approved treatment, and looking at whether treatment's safe, whether it works, and the quality, the consistency with which it can be produced. And that's all really important. But actually something else happens after you've got the license, which is you need to get the treatment to the patients. And to get it to the patients, you need to be reimbursed. And in this country and in, in many countries to be reimbursed, you have to go through something called HTA, Health Technology Assessment. Um, in England and Wales, that's nice. I'm sure most of you have heard of that. Um, and payers, so I think NHS England. And they're really interested in slightly different questions. How effective is this treatment? Is it good value for money? And increasingly looking at whether or not it's affordable. Because they're interested in different questions, they're interested in different evidence. A different role, and so a really important role for patients and patient organizations in engaging with that. So what can patients bring to HTA? Well, they can bring a different perspective. The evidence, the data that comes before a committee such as NICE can be incredibly complex, but not necessarily easy to understand what it means in real life. Patients, clinicians, scientists can all have a slightly different take on what that same evidence, that same data means. As one member of a, a NICE committee said, without the patient voice, it's easier to just be a bit more dismissive of that data to not really understand the impact on patients and families. So in terms of what patients bring, and I think this is really important to understand, there are two types of thing you can bring to HGA, bring to reimbursement discussions. One is evidence and one is experience. They're slightly different. So you can bring qualitative and quantitative evidence and what we call experiential or lived experience. 
about the condition, about the treatment, as well as individual patient stories that will really describe that impact. Um, and it's hugely important, but what does that actually mean? What do patient organizations or patients have to do? Well, you can drive evidence generation. So in order to make the decisions nice, in order to answer those questions about how effective the impact of a new treatment, then quite a lot of evidence is needed. Put up a couple of examples there where patient organizations have really driven evidence generation. Can represent the views of patients, members of your organization, your own views, engage with clinical and patient experts, and just follow up, keep pushing the process forward, keep making sure the point has got across, and really importantly, collaborate with other patient organizations. So I've made it to the final slide with 30 seconds to spare, fantastic. Um, so there is support available. Um, certainly from NICE, help you better understand the processes and how to engage in them. There are fantastic conferences like this and find a cure events where you will hear a lot more. Some of those do tend to be a little more on the theoretical than the practical side. And that's where Realize Advocacy hopes to help and provide really practical support. Um, Rick is actually speaking at our, our first event on the 8th of July, measuring what matters, supporting patients to engage in HTA. Um, do come along if you can. I'm done. How did I do? <laughs> so well, Josie. Really good. <laughs> that was so good. So going forward, we're now going to give the stage to Sophie. So I will give it to you, Sophie, to take it from there and share the screen. Best of luck. So yes, um, I did warn you there'll be a lot of acronyms in this. So I'm from the Medical Research Council. I'm a program manager uh, in the translation team. And my patch particularly is repurposing studies. So my job is dedicated to supporting repurposing of therapies um, and getting them to patients. Um, so this is government funding and we're part of UK Research and Innovation, which includes all of the research councils, um, Research England, which supports universities and Innovate UK, which supports um, companies. So even if the Medical Research Council isn't the home for your research, then talk, talk to me anyway. And we have brothers and sisters throughout the organization who hopefully we can connect you with. Um, so the MRC has a complicated set of funding schemes. Um, if you look at the, trans, the kind of translational pathway across the top, um, we support dis basic discovery research. So understanding the mechanisms of disease through our boards and through fellowships. Um, and we also want to take these findings, um, whether they've been found using MRC funding or not, through um, developing proof of concept for a health technology, through preclinical development, clinical trials, and um, obviously eventually um, adoption and access. Um, the MRC focuses on these dark blue stages. So we support um, up to phase 2A clinical trials through our schemes, including developmental pathway funding scheme, which I'll mention again in a minute. We also partner with NIHR to support the efficacy and mechanism evaluation scheme, commonly known as EMI, um, which supports later phase clinical trials as well. So we have our fingers in lots of pies and hoping to cover the whole pipeline of, um, of translational research. Um, also, like, oh, so the, this kind of package of, of scheme has a budget of around £70 million pounds a year, um, which is quite a significant chunk of the UK funding in translational research. We also had um, an asset sharing scheme, which is currently dormant, um, but I wanted to mention it because it's exactly what we were talking about earlier in the day about get, getting academic access to deprioritized compounds. Um, within industry. So this scheme started in 2013 and it went through a number of iterations and the list that the companies provided is out of date now basically. So we need to go back and kind of work out what's needed now. So the discussions we're having today um, will be really informative and, and that's my project for the next year is to get something going again in that space. Um, and I also wanted to mention the Population Systems Medicine Board where the, the um, insight into the pathophysiology of rare diseases is a priority for that board. So this is named and as a board opportunity 
um, aiming to support the UK rare diseases framework. Um, and so again, this is for academic led research, but I, I just wanted to point it out because I do think there is a common um, myth that we don't care about rare diseases. Um, it's actually a priority for us within this board and those and applications working rare diseases will receive a um, bump up the list when it comes to the, the ranking of the funding applications at the end. I don't know why that keeps coming up. Um, so the DPFS scheme basically, so my, my, the strategy I've gone for is put loads of information on all your slides so that you can have this information later and all of these links um, and then talk about not much at all, but that was that's the strategy. I hope it's helpful. So the DPFS scheme um, has some information there, but it has a budget of 30 to 35 million pounds a year, which is just to show you we can really make an impact here. So that supports um, all sorts of different health technologies, including repurposing of drugs and biologic therapies. And um, it also supports advanced therapies and rare diseases. So lots of rare diseases come up. Um, we've supported over 300 projects in the last 10 years, more than 350 million pounds in total. And again, loads of links here, but that's for you to go away and play with later. But um, currently in my portfolio, there's, oh, I'm already gonna go over time. Um, there's 11 active awards um, where drugs are being repurposed. So you can see the range of diseases and treatments that we're um, supporting here. So you'll hear from Tim Barrett, um, about his project in Wolfram syndrome tomorrow, I think, or later today. Yeah. Um, and this project in anchor vasculitis, which we heard about earlier, using hydroxychloroquine and other commonly repurposed drugs. So lots going on, lots of partnerships with companies where the academics are partnering with companies and we have a framework to enable this to go well. Um, and this is where I should just stop. Uh, last plug is for a new scheme called the Experimental Medicine Panel. So this is about um, uh, perturbing the system with a drug, um, a repurposed drug perhaps, probably, um, and finding out more about the disease. Um, so you might not be aiming to take this, this is kind of earlier stage research before um, you have the proof of concept to commercialize something. Um, and this is a new scheme that started last year. So there's a plug for the next deadline there, but I basically, these are all the people that work on, on the translation team and please contacting me. My job is to help people access this funding. So um, get in touch with any questions and uh, enjoy perusing my very wordy slides later. <laughs> thank you, Sophie. And also <laughs> thank you for making the time to talk to us because that's a heck of a schedule, my friend. <laughs> that leaves us with Tim, who's gonna close the show with his lightning talk on his hopes for a repurposed treatment for a rare bone disease. So Tim, I will let you take the stage and I'm so excited to hear what you're going to say. Um, so hi everyone, uh, thank you for the opportunity to share with you about sclerosis. Um, I am a researcher and one of very few people with this incredibly rare condition um, of which approximately only a hundred cases have been documented worldwide so far and uh, Two thirds of which are actually um, of Afrikaner descent from South Africa. So, sclerosis is uh, autosomal recessive and is characterized by excessive bone formation. Um, so, the variable fused fingers and toes and dysplastic or absent nails are the earliest postnatal indicators of the condition. And uh, third, further clinical features include increased bone mineral density throughout the skeleton, and you have generalized progressive skeletal overgrowth that occurs and is most pronounced in the skull, uh, mandible, and lung bones. Uh, this overgrowth can result in potentially lethal elevated intracranial pressure, uh, hearing loss, as well as recurrent facial paralysis. So sclerosis has no available treatment and is managed through difficult and prolonged surgery. And unfortunately, post-surgical bone regrowth, regrowth often occurs and may cause recurrence of these symptoms, so necessitating repeat surgeries. So new treatment options for osteoarthrosis will therefore bring significant benefits to patients. So the condition has been extensively researched and um, 
A point mutation in the SOS gene that resulted in loss of functional sclerostin was identified as its cause. Um, this research proved crucial for development of successful therapeutic to treat osteoporosis, in fact, um, in postmenopausal women at high risk of fracture. Uh, while this drug is of no use to osteoporosis patient, it is quite humbling to know that the drug came about as a direct result of studying our disease. So sclerostin, uh, that's the soft gene product, is important for maintaining bone homeostasis and has been shown to play a key role in bone modeling and remodeling by acting as a negative regulator of bone formation. And um, as part of my PhD, I investigated protein replacement therapy as a treatment option for this disease. And um, our recombinant sclerostin proteins demonstrated modest efficacy. So, but due to the modest efficacy, we decided that it would be a good idea to actually also explore alternative approaches. We, we are therefore currently initiating a new project uh, in the UK that will investigate existing drugs that can modulate major signaling pathways associated with sclerosteosis. If these drugs prove to be effective, um, we aim to repurpose them and potentially accelerating a sclerosteosis treatment to clinic. So, and then um, I decided, decided early in my career that I would I would raise awareness of this rare disease and the serious, seriousness of the associated pathology. And in a big step towards that, the, the birth of family, uh, which is a family with another sclerosis patient, and I started the Rare Bone Disease Foundation. The foundation aims to raise awareness of this incredibly rare condition and um, has been quite effective in that regard. So we've had two families that were able to get an early diagnosis when members or friends of those families recognized symptoms that were uh, mentioned on our group or in interviews that I conducted with our local news agency. The platform further used for fundraising and provides a support platform for patients and their family. And although our group has held patients and their families, they're still um, remains the need to raise awareness among medical professionals, uh, especially in South Africa, uh, because early diagnosis should result in earlier um, implementation of preventative measures. And it's also therefore crucial that we develop a treatment that when prescribed in an early age will negate the need of excessive surgery, thereby greatly improving the quality of life of patients and their families. Um, so ultimately, we hope that our investigation of the existing drugs will yield promising candidates um, that can be repurposed to treat these patients. Uh, thank you. Oh, thank you, Tim. Perfect timing. Was that a bang on five? Pretty much, yeah. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Pushpa Hussain, who's our first speaker from RWE, who is RWE manager at HCD Economics. And I will now let Pushpa share her screen. Hi everyone, my name is Pushpa. I'm uh, a real world evidence manager at HCD Economics. So a little bit about my background. I'm uh, a medical doctor by background and education. And I came to UK to do my master's in public health. And then I got interested into translational research. Right after my master's, I joined a charity called Metabolic Support UK, and I was the head of patient engagement, advocacy, and research there. Worked there for a couple of years, and recently I have moved to a consultancy called HCD Economics, and now I work as a real-world evidence manager. I wanted to share my, a little bit of my experience with you today and tell you a little bit more about what evidence-based advocacy means from my perspective. Advocacy in general is an effective way to work together to encourage someone and it's usually it's a decision maker to take action. It's also a great way to raise awareness among the general population and among people. Everyone can engage in advocacy as a way to create, implement and change policies or even the living standards for the good of a larger group of people. 
we all have done some sort of advocacy work at different stages of our lives. However, what an individual patient needs and want is, is very different sometimes than uh, the general public because patients, patients differ individually and they're heterogeneous. And there are lots of differences between diseases and even within the disease itself, depending on the stage of disease and depending on prior experience of treatment and stage of life and obviously the social environment as well. This may not be very obvious to other stakeholders and also to individual patients. However, healthcare providers, authorities and researchers need to base their decisions on evidence. But sometimes when there's a lack of data about what patients really want, it's the decisions are often based on assumptions about patients' needs and the clinical needs. Patients and advocates are actually in the best position to express what patients want and need. At the end of the day, they are the true experts. However, individual opinions are not always helpful to take decisions forward, discussions forward for a whole population of patients and to convince researchers, healthcare providers, and obviously the regulatory decision makers. In rare disease world, we have heard a lot about authorities saying, don't bring me a room full of crying babies and crying mothers, bring me data and evidence. In order to help healthcare to focus on the needs of patients and their subpopulations, it helps if patient advocates argue with evidence and data. It is difficult for decision makers to ignore robust evidence. This is what evidence-based advocacy means from my perspective. The concept of evidence-based patient advocacy means advocating in a targeted evidence-based, well-educated and professional manner. And this allows us to measure the impact and outcomes for the advocacy work. However, in order for us to do this, patient advocates need to, be, need to acquire the skills and resources needed to generate this level of evidence in their own community, as well as use that evidence in a targeted way. In my previous work at the charity Metabolic Support UK, we were able to publish a case study to demonstrate the opportunities and obstacles faced by a community of, uh, of patients called XLH, X-linked hypophosphatemia. So we published this case study about their experience uh, with engaging with HTA, a health technology assessment, uh, basically the, uh, the HST highly specialized technology process within NICE. That case study, was published and is available in public domain uh, in the conference of, uh, called ECRD, which is the European Conference on Rare Disease and Orphan Drugs. Currently, the company I'm working in, uh, it's called HCD Economics. We try to empower patients and patient groups to speak to us and tell me what their unmet needs are. I love hearing people uh, telling me what their concerns are. I love having open discussions. I work and do my best to empower charities and to collaborate together, to become equal partners, to generate the piece of evidence and data that's needed to support the patients and the charities' advocacy campaigns. So these are some examples of the work that HCD Economics have done. Um, and there are plenty more on our website. So if you have, if you would like to have a look, please visit our website. If you have any questions um, or anything I can personally help you with, based on my experience, feel free to contact me. And this is me, hopefully under the five minutes. <laughs> yep, you beat the bell just in time. Well done, Fish Friend. Thank you so much. That was really, really Every great day. to listen to. Um, next up, we've got Kim Daybell, who's a junior doctor and Paralympian, and he's gonna be talking to you for five minutes in our lightning session now. So over to you, Kim. Uh, okay, so hi guys. First of all, thanks for coming. Uh, my name's Kim Daybell. Uh, I'm a doctor working in A&E in North London at the moment. Um, I also have Poland syndrome, which is what I'm here to talk to you about. Uh, and I'm a two-time Paralympian, having competed uh, in table tennis in London and Rio, and now training up for, for Tokyo 2021, which where it's now been coined. So Poland syndrome is not a condition that's well known in general, and this is why it's really great to get talking about it at conferences like this, which are around rare diseases. It affects approximately one in 30,000 people, um, but that data isn't great as a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the data collected on it is misdiagnosis or it's coded wrong, um, or in general, it's not diagnosed at all. 
it's inherited sporadically, so it doesn't necessarily pass on from generation to generation. Um, and the main characteristic is that individuals are born with uh, missing pectoral muscles on one side of the body. It is also associated with hand deformities on the same side um, or hyperplasia of the breast or nipple tissue on that side as well. And is also linked to some other rarer diseases such as Mobius syndrome, dextrocardia, and some lymphomas. So why am I talking about it? I guess, uh, as you can see on the picture here, this is when I first graduated uh, in 2018, starting on my first few weeks on the wards. Um, and I yeah, became a doctor when I graduated from the University of Leeds. The other side of my life uh, is that I'm also a table tennis player. So I was born with Poland syndrome um, and I had lack of muscles on the right side, as I described before, and I had no fingers on my right hand as well. So when I was two years old, Professor Simon Kay, who's a hand surgeon who works in Leeds, did a bilateral toe transplant where he took two toes from each foot, stitched them onto my hands so that I could basically have opposable digits and I could grip things, hold things. And that kind of started my journey on to becoming a doctor, I guess, because obviously having one hand makes life very difficult when you're trying to do a few different things. Um, table tennis wise, I, I started playing when I was nine years old. I became a national player when I was 11. And then at the age of 16, the Paralympic team picked me up when we got the bid for London 2012. And I started competing on the Paralympic circuit, which I've been doing for the last 10 years. I played in two Paralympic games. Uh, I'm the current Commonwealth silver medalist, British number one, um, and have been ranked in the top five in the world at certain points in my career. And also, as I said, training towards Tokyo 2021, which is hopefully, hopefully happening after the COVID situation. Um, my last year has been taken up as a junior doctor, obviously working on, on COVID wards and A&E. So training hasn't been ideal, but fingers crossed we'll get to where we need to. And I've had a dual career, really. I've, I've always uh, studied and worked alongside my medical degree. Um, and I play table tennis um, and work part time to allow myself time to train. Um, and it's been really amazing. And now I've got the platform as, a, as an elite athlete and as a doctor. I'm trying to raise awareness for, for Poland syndrome in the UK, particularly when, within medical circles. So I started work uh, with Sam, who's also on this call. She uh, head, heads up the Poland Syndrome Support Group, which is PIP UK. And at the moment, we're working on develop, developing a database for people with Poland Syndrome to help early diagnosis and to educate medical, medical professionals. As, as a wider kind of thing, I'm, I'm trying to get my face out there to help younger people who might have disabilities to encourage them to be involved with medicine, because I see very few disabled doctors and medical professionals, and I think that's a real shame. Um, and I think it's, it's my duty to act as a role model and to, to hopefully encourage them uh, that they can go on and, and, be, and be doctors and be nurses and, and help to, to give back. You know, when, when you've got a disability, you've obviously been helped by the medical community in the past. And uh, that's something that really resounded with me. And it's why I wanted to become a doctor at the end of the day. Just a, a few points. Italy offers the best model. Uh, it's an MDT approach. So looking at mental health, uh, looking at people, uh, plastic surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, physios, bringing everyone together in one place so people with Poland syndrome can go there. We're also looking at developing a database so we know exactly how many people in the UK have Poland syndrome. With this data, we can then go on to uh, Public Health England, to the NHS, and develop a nice criteria for how to manage people once they've been diagnosed. Generally, just trying to improve that public and professional awareness of the condition uh, is something that I'm particularly passionate about. Um, that's it really in a, in a kind of whistle stop tour. I hope that you can remember kind of uh, about Poland syndrome, which was mainly, mainly my goal. And um, just from thinking of me as an example, I suppose it's always easier when you, when you've kind of seen someone with, with the condition or heard someone speak with the condition. Um, and hopefully as a rare disease, it, it, we can, uh, we can develop it a little bit. We can hopefully move towards the, 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 program that Italy have um, as well, offering the MDT clinics. Um, and I'm hoping to work closely with, with Poland Syndrome UK uh, in the next two, three, four, five years um, to help just uh, develop people with, uh, with Poland Syndrome and to help manage them once they start to get into their adult lives, because they then can develop to go on to develop musculoskeletal problems if they're not helped early on with physio, etc. That's me. I think the bell just went. Thanks. Yeah, sorry, the sound wasn't on. <laughs> um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it interesting. Uh, any questions, please feel free to email me on the email provided.
Thank you so much for that, Kim. That was really um, great. Uh, fantastic talk. And I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. Right. So I'd just like to invite our next speaker now, Martin Twycross, um, who's manager at Dendrite Clinical Systems to um, take the lightning talk stage and tell you his five minutes. So uh, good morning. And uh... Kim, that was a very interesting talk. I think you and I need to speak afterwards. So uh, my name is Martin Twycross. I work for a small UK company called Dendrite Clinical Systems. We've been providing uh, clinical data services for coming up to 30 years now. In that uh, 30 years, we've produced uh, a little over 200 registries, and that's national registries from the UK out to New Zealand and all points in between. And so far, we've covered from A, allergies, out to V for venous and vascular. We haven't yet got to a Z registry, but maybe Zebra would change that. Uh, we've worked with the NHS in NICE and the UK. Uh, NICE and NHS in the UK and our latest project has been uh, the COVID Diab registry which is looking at the junction of COVID and diabetes. Looking specifically at rare diseases and rare conditions for paediatrics we've got registries in gastroschisis, hyperspades and rare conditions like that. Thrive is looking at uh, vitamin balance for cystic fibrosis patients the Waldenstroms and the mascot registries are patient led. They were initiated by patient initiatives. And something I'm looking forward to later in this year, a project that's under construction, is a registry which will be collecting disease specific information and has an advisory panel behind it. So basically a GP or a clinician in the field who maybe see one rare disease case in his clinical career can actually receive direct advice from an advisory panel. So just to, to make sure, what is a registry? Well, quite simply, it's a database. We take input from clinicians and we amalgamate that and we can look at that as real time data or publications and reports. We can also take direct patient feedback. Uh, the role of a registry is to look at real world data real world evidence and as we've seen this morning sometimes clinical trials are impractical or unsuitable in this area and to be able to include everybody allows you to combine a large amount of data and make a small number of rare disease cases visible. Also something we've worked with regulatory bodies with NICE in the UK uh, we've been allowed to provide registries for off-label use of products and devices but I want to specifically look at a registry. This is Waldenstrom's, and that's Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, which I struggle to say, as I think many people would. It's a, a rare disease, uh, it's a blood cancer effectively. So we've collected data on that since approximately 2014. There are about a thousand patients registered across the UK. And the first report on this came out in 2018. Now, the first thing that did just on the demographic data was debunk the myth that it's a disease of elderly white men. In fact, the reality is 35% of the um, patients are in their 30s and 40s and a significant proportion are female. The first report also highlighted the need for um, further follow up information on mental health and quality of life which leads me neatly on to the, the PROMS aspect, patient reported outcome monitoring. Part of our registries is an automated PROMS system, which allows you to take feedback directly into the registry. In a secure manner, we put out emails or we put out text messages and could be as simple as smiley faces, or it could be one of any of 30 or 40 standardized quality of life questionnaires. Uh, the Waldenstrom's we use is HADS, which is anxiety and depression, and the EORTC, which is a 30 question cancer quality of life questionnaire. Now, is what I can say, we've had uh, three to 400 responses every quarter through this mechanism in that registry for the last three or four years. Unfortunately, is what I can't say is that the report detailing the outcomes of that was pushed back from uh, Easter to September. So I can't say anything specifically on the um, the cases and the outputs that they've found from that. 
Um, so the criteria for a successful registry is to set up clear and explicit objectives that uh, you want to get out of it. Uh, obviously, the data fields have to support that. And one of the key learning points is it must be easy to use. If a clinician's not able to complete the data forms within five, max 10 minutes, you're not going to get completion. You're not going to get uh, a good uh, output from it. At the end of the day, uh, a company motto is reveal, interpret and improve. So we look to improve clinical practice and ultimately have better outcomes for patients. So thank you. That was indeed a lightning tour. Um, and here we go. <laughs> is that the I, I, that Lisa, <laughs> straight on the straight on the five minute dot there I think you and Pushpa came to a tie um go. and and Kim came in a close second behind you but um, it was well worth it to hear how he uses his platforms to raise awareness so that concludes our um, session and I bet everybody is really raring to go get some lunch now so I won't keep you too long. Um, just wanted to thank you all for attending today and to let you know that we look forward to seeing you back at two o'clock uh, two o'clock for our workshop sessions with Helix and Life Arc this afternoon so I hope you have all managed to sign up to, to some of them um, and a big thank you again to Pushpa, Kim and Martin. Your talks were all fantastic at telling us more about the work that you do and the awareness that you raise and it's just been a delight to hear you all speak so thanks to everyone and um, send us any questions after the session if you didn't manage to get them in the previous time thanks so much everyone bye-bye thank you everyone